deep under the stones. Early archaeologists found antler horns, pottery, and even human remains in the area. Modern radiocarbon dating offers new and more accurate dates to work with, superseding less reliable tests of the past. Scientists can now test artifacts like this antler horn to tell exactly how old it is. And because it was buried directly underneath the stones, it tells us the most likely date when Stonehenge was built. In tests published in 1995, scientists discover that some previous estimates had been wrong. The final phase of Stonehenge was older than they thought. It was built as far back as 4,000 years ago. It's been stunning news for archaeologists such as Mike Pitts. The new radiocarbon dating of Stonehenge has had the biggest impact on our understanding of the monument since people first recognised it as something created by people many centuries ago. It's the first hard evidence of a date, and it rules out the Druids as possible constructors, who only came to Britain around 2,000 years ago. In fact, it eliminates many of the usual suspects. The search for the builders of Stonehenge needs to travel much further back in time. It's certainly not a Roman building. It isn't the work of the late coming Druids, nor of the waves of settlers from all over Europe. Carbon dating proves Stonehenge is far older than all those civilizations with the first phase predating the Great Pyramids of Egypt. So the tests suggest that Stonehenge is the work of ancient Britons, a primitive and little-known people. It seems unbelievable. Four and a half thousand years ago, Britain was nearing the end of the Stone Age and the start of the Bronze Age. Its people were subsistence farmers technologically undeveloped and just starting to understand how to work with metal. How could such primitive people have pulled off such an incredible construction feat? This was, by anyone's standards, a huge construction job. The first problem any ancient builders faced was getting hold of the construction materials, the stones that make up Stonehenge. And that was far from easy. There are two types of stones at Stonehenge. The smaller ones are called the blue stones, believed to have been hauled to the site before the larger sarsen stones. But once the sarsen ring had been erected, the builders seemed to have had second thoughts. The smaller blue stones were repositioned over the years within it. No one knows why. And there is another puzzling question. Just where had all these stones come from? In one case, the answer is easy. Similar rocks to the large sarsen stones can be seen some 20 miles from Stonehenge. Using manpower to haul the rocks to the site would be tough, but not impossible. But the blue stones are a different matter. They're not from this area at all. In fact, even tracing their source isn't easy. The clues to where they originated can be found with the rock experts at the British Geological Survey. Here, in a vast collection, are rock samples from all over Britain, every one with its characteristic crystalline texture preserved as a microscope slide. and each specimen cross-referenced to the geological map of Britain. Is there a match between the rock type of the blue stones and a sample in the collection? And can that reveal the source of the stones anywhere in the British Isles? 
Under the microscope, the distinctive crystalline texture of the blue stones are a close match with samples already in the collection. They can even be traced to one specific location, the Priscelli Mountain Range in southwest Wales. It's a clever piece of deductive science, but it poses as big a riddle as it solves. The Priscelli Mountains are more than 200 miles away from Stonehenge. The journey begins in tough terrain, and then, just to make it tougher, involves crossing England's biggest tidal estuary. So how could stones weighing as much as four tons be carried such a long way with just the primitive technology of ancient Britons some 4,500 years ago? Perhaps one answer is they never were carried. Perhaps ancient Britons just found the stones already lying amongst Salisbury Plain, deposited there by a powerful force of nature. the movement of ice. It was not long after England's last ice age, when massive ice sheets spread down from the Arctic as far as southern England. Glaciers so powerful, they could easily sweep huge rocks across the landscape. Could such glaciers be responsible for shifting the blue stones? The answer may lie in the remote mountains of Wales. Local author and researcher Robin Heath is a man passionate about the mysteries of the Priscelli Bluestones and ancient Britons. I get excited about coming up here because these are my ancestors and this is the culture of Britain. Heath has been exploring here for the last 20 years cataloguing peculiarities about the stones. Old artifacts provide the latest clues for our investigation. Many of the stones here at Priscelli have giant stone wedges stuck between them. Someone, at some time, has tried to prise them away from the rock face. And there is even more compelling evidence that these rocks have been shaped and worked on. There are some stones that have show evidence of being cut to size. And there are other stone tools being found by several people that appear to have been used for dressing the stone somewhat before its journey. Stone Age tools found nearby suggests that these rocks were being worked by men around the time that the blue stones appeared at Stonehenge. But the most clear evidence that the glacier theory is unlikely can be found at Stonehenge itself. There are no other blue stones to be found where the monument stands on the vast expanse of Salisbury Plain. And what sort of glacier would deposit only these few massive rocks and leave no other trace of its passage? The probable conclusion? It was our late Stone Age ancestors who transported those stones. Which begs the next question. How did they do it? We call a professional, an undoubted expert in managing massive scale